thank you everybody for tuning in. I'm super excited to introduce you to Dr. Joanna Moncrief, who is a psychiatrist in Britain and or in England specifically, right? Mm -hmm. And a professor at the University College London and a consultant psychiatrist with the National Health Service in London, working with people who have severe mental disorders. You're a, an author of four books, including The Myth of the Chemical Cure, A Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Drugs, The Bitterest Pills, and, and then you recently published a second edition of A Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Drugs. And you've just been you know, traveling the world talking about something that I think is extremely important, which is why I invited you onto this podcast. And what we're going to talk about primarily is psychiatric drugs. And you, know, you have a, a statement right in the beginning of your recent book which is, my concern is that we fundamentally misunderstand what psychiatric drugs do. And because of this, we overestimate their possible benefits and underestimate the harm they can cause. So that's kind of the centerpiece of our conversation here, is what this misunderstanding is and what the reality is. So maybe we can start there. I have some other questions I want to ask too that'll be appropriate in the beginning, but, but let's just dive right into that. So will you explain what is this misunderstanding that we have about psychiatric drugs? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think that's a good place to start too. So the, the thing is that we have been led to believe for a long time, and by we I include the general public, but also professionals and psychiatrists and academics and psychopharmacology researchers, that what psychiatric drugs do is target underlying biological abnormalities, and uh, like a, a chemical imbalance or a serotonin deficiency, and that they exert their beneficial effects by correcting those underlying abnormalities. And what I realized is that it turns out there is no evidence at all for these abnormalities or that that is what the drugs are doing. What we know the drugs are doing is that they are altering the normal state of the brain uh, and the body too, but the, the drugs that we prescribe for mental health problems are all drugs that affect the brain, that cross the blood-brain barrier and affect the brain. And they change the normal state of the brain. They modify the brain and therefore they change the way that people think and feel and behave. And therefore they change the symptoms uh, that we associate with mental disorders or the abnorm abnormalities of behavior and thinking and feeling that we call mental disorders. And so, so what, what I've been trying to get across to people is what we should understand drugs are do, psychiatric drugs as, do, as doing is changing the normal state of the human body and brain um, and working in that way, not rectifying any underlying abnormality. And the reason that is so important is that if you start from the idea that you've got something wrong with you, there's something um, you know, abnormal going on in your brain, and someone suggests that you could take a drug that corrects that, that sounds like a good idea. If, if, you, if, if we're honest about the fact that we've no idea what's going on in people's brains when they're depressed or psychotic or anxious or um, hyperactive or anything else, but we've got these drugs that change the normal state of the brain and change it to an abnormal state, that doesn't sound so appealing. That sounds a little bit worrying. And that's exactly how it should be. We should be worried about using these drugs. They, they don't make anything normal. They make the way that the body and brain functions abnormal. Mm. Um, and therefore, we should worry about them. Now, there are some situations in which I think that those changes that drugs produce are probably the lesser of two evils. It's probably better to be in a mildly drugged state if you're very severely psychotic for some people than it is not to be. Um, if you're very, very highly anxious, 
a drug that um, relaxes you and reduces your arousal level, puts you in a sleepier state may be helpful. Um, but much of the time, it's not helpful to be in that drug-induced altered state of, of mind. Mm. That doesn't really help you to address whatever it is that's going on. Mm. You laid that out beautifully. And in fact, I want to actually read something from The Bitterest Pills here. You, you lay this out very nicely and you describe what you, what you call the disease-centered model, which is the predominant narrative that psychiatric drugs cure abnormalities, and then the drug-centered model, which I interpret as the honest explanation of what's really happening. And what you lay out very nicely here in terms of the difference between these two models or paradigms is that in the disease-centered model, what we say, what the narrative is, is that drugs correct an abnormal brain state. But in the evidence-based, honest, drug-centered model, the fact is drugs create an abnormal state. In the disease-centered model, we say drugs are medical treatments. In the drug-centered model, we say drugs are psychoactive substances. Disease-centered model, we say the beneficial effects of drugs are derived from their effects on a presumed disease process. But in the drug-centered model, we say the drugs alter the expression of psychiatric problems through the superimposition of drug-induced effects. And an example of something that fits in, honestly fits in, to the disease-centered model is insulin for diabetes. But an example that is much more true to what psychiatric drugs are like is alcohol for social anxiety. So I just think that that's very important that people understand this, that um, you know, the, the, my understanding is that the origin of the narrative that drugs correct chemical imbalances was really a marketing ploy, in a sense, um, particularly when the SSRIs, the, the antidepressant drugs, were hitting the market in the 90s. You know, these pharmaceutical companies recognized a need to have this sort of explanation that sounded scientific, but was also easily understandable and marketable. And that's about as much grounding in, in reality as that has. So, I, so there, was a, there was a germ of these theories, these chemical imbalance theories in psychiatry developed in the 1960s and 1970s. But what happened when the SSRI antidepressants came along in the 90s was that the, like you say, the drug companies picked up those ideas and ran with it, ran with them and flooded the um, media and medical education and everywhere with this idea that depression was a chemical imbalance and antidepressants were working by rectifying it. And they did that very specifically because there'd been this scandal about the overuse of benzodiazepines in the 1980s and they needed to reassure people that the widespread prescribing of antidepressants was different from the use of benzodiazepines, that this was not just another um, medical pacifier, just not another sort of sedative to, you know, blot out people's worries, that this was a real medical treatment that was going to work by targeting an underlying disease. So that's why that happened at that particular point. Mm. And it's, it's just so consistent with the broader historical pattern in psychiatry of having to respond to these very valid criticisms and kind of compensate for their for their lack of legitimacy in, in a sense with you know I mean obviously if you look back far enough it is undeniable that the treatments that were being used like frontal lobotomies and organ removal and high pressure shower therapy and all the all these torturous type of treatments it's undeniable that they were ineffective and harmful. Um, and then now it's a little bit harder to gauge that, but I think, you know, you among many others just make a very strong case, you know, that, well, you raise the question, do the adverse effects or the benefits, which one outweighs the other here? And I also, I also want to just ask you this question while we're talking about this. Obviously, these different types of drugs, antidepressants versus anti-anxiety drugs and antipsychotics, have different mechanisms. 
and different effects. So in your sense, are any of them more harmful? Should we be more worried about any particular category? Uh, yes, good question. Um, it's important to emphasize that they're, they're all different sorts of drugs. They all have different sorts of effects on the brain and the body, different systems in the body. It's also important to emphasize that, that, um, that antidepressants as a class are very different from each other. The, the, or the class of antidepressants um, includes all sorts of drugs which act in different ways. And similarly, the class of antipsychotics includes drugs that act in different sorts of ways. Overall, though, as a generalization, I would say that antipsychotics are more harmful. That's where the evidence exists that they can cause persisting brain damage in the form of tardive dyskinesia, that they can cause shrinkage of the brain, um, and which, which may or may not be, but the, the balance of evidence probably is related to some degree of cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. So, um, on the other hand, I think that antipsychotics, if someone is very acutely psychotic, can sometimes be useful. Mm. Whereas antidepressants, which generally have, I would say, less severe um, adverse effects, although they, they can cause some, some extreme difficulties, um, uh, but generally have less severe adverse effects. But on the other hand, I'm just not sure that they're useful at all. Mm. So there's, there's a different balance of pros and cons for the different drugs and it also depends on what sort of situation you're thinking about using them in what exact what, what exactly are the problems that someone is experiencing right and maybe at this moment just in, for people who may not be aware maybe we can color in the picture of what the adverse effects are you've just mentioned a couple extremely significant ones I've, i'm aware of this evidence as well of uh, shrinkage of the brain and particularly in the cortex which is just disturbing to me and of course that comes along with cognitive impairment so difficulty focusing difficulty problem solving memory impairments um, sometimes it comes with just I mean again depending on which category we're talking about but often extreme lethargy and people sleeping excessively I did a dissertation where I did a multiple case study and each person in that case study was taking Risperdal, which is a drug prescribed for schizophrenia. And every single one of them reported to me that they were sleeping for 13 hours a day, typically. Yeah. Some people yeah. experience, yes. And, and just to think about how, you know, how much that can throw off your rhythm in your life is significant. Um, so many people. I mean, I mean, we'll be here all day if you want me to s recite all the adverse effects mm -hmm. of all the psychiatric drugs because there are a lot. Mm -hmm. There are a lot. Um, when we're thinking about antipsychotics, they are all or almost all extremely sedative substances. So people will be feeling very sleepy. They will sleep a lot when they're awake. They'll feel slowed down, foggy. Um, you know, find it hard to uh, motivate themselves. They also seem to flatten emotions so that people say that, you know, they, they can't really experience sort of strong emotions or, or even ordinary emotions anymore, which most people find really distressing. And some people complain that they, they dampen their creativity and they really change their personality. They uh, dampen down your sex drive and, and um, have other sorts of sexual complications as well. So, uh, and and um, most of them make people put on weight mm -hmm. uh, and some of them make people put on a lot of weight and make you much more likely to get diabetes. So there are all sorts of nasty side effects, uh, adverse effects associated with antipsychotics. Um, antidepressants, as I said, the modern generation of antidepressants, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs, have fewer noticeable adverse effects when you take them. They probably also cause some sort of emotional flattening or disengagement, though. Um, but, and, and, and they cause sexual dysfunction, that's very well recorded. And, uh, but, the, but, but some of the most worrying effects are that when people try and stop them, some people can get really unpleasant and prolonged withdrawal syndromes. And some people get persistent sexual dysfunction as well.
mm. and after stopping them. On that note right there, often when people try to come off of a drug and they begin to experience the withdrawal symptoms, often this is interpreted as see the drug was working because look what happened when you tried to come off of it, you went back to being unstable. But can you help us understand why that is not necessarily the accurate interpretation? Yes, absolutely. I think it's become clearer and clearer over the last few years that when you stop a drug, you get all sorts of problems that you wouldn't necessarily have if you'd never started it in the first place. Um, that are related to stopping the drug because the drug has changed the normal state of your brain. So when you take it away, the brain's wondering, where is this drug? Or, you, you know, and it, and, and it's it, because the brain has changed to compensate for the effects of the drug. If you take the drug away, those compensatory changes won't be balanced out anymore. And we don't know how long it takes the brain to get back to normal or if indeed if it ever does quite get back to normal. Now, some of the work that shows the problems of withdrawal most clearly um, is some work on the, the discontinuation of lithium in people who have a diagnosis of manic depression or bipolar disorder. If you stop lithium, you are more likely to have a relapse of your bipolar disorder, have an episode, than you were before you started it. Mm. There's something about the state of having lithium discontinued. Lithium is the very... Um, neurotoxic drug which clearly has a very profound effect on the nervous system and when you take it away um, I, I think what's happening is that the nervous system is just completely um, over aroused and oversensitive and therefore you're much more likely to um, be triggered into having a relapse of, uh, of your bipolar and, and the relapses are particularly manic relapses over arousal relapses characterized by over arousal mm. So, so I think I, I think that is happening in a lot of cases that um, you know the brain, the brain adaptations that are, have happened when you've been taking the drug have not normalised, and, and therefore you get all sorts of withdrawal effects which can go on for ages and can be mistaken for relapse or can precipitate a relapse in themselves. Another thing that I think is happening is I think people, I I, I think people become very anxious and, and, and people think that they need their drug and therefore if they stop it and they start to feel a bit weird because they're getting some sort of withdrawal syndrome, they, um, they interpret it as being a relapse. And of course, many doctors will interpret it as being a relapse and family members will interpret it as being a relapse. So for example, when you stop taking um, an SSRI, it seems that you probably become more anxious and a little bit hypersensitive to things, um, uh, to stimuli, and so so some people will think, oh my goodness, I'm you know I'm 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 heading for a relapse, uh, and and then that can become a self fulfilling prophecy if people you know become so anxious. So that's yeah that that's yeah. what I think is happening when when people stop medication, and I think it's really important to recognise that because we know that more and more people are going on to medication and just getting stuck on it for long periods of time, for years and years and years for the rest of their lives. And many of those people, I think, if they did it carefully, could potentially get off their medication. Mm -hmm. um, but they've become convinced or they've been told again and again that, no, they can't. You know, look, you tried to stop and you just relapsed. Don't be silly. You can't try it again. Mm. And I, I know you talk about how to carefully withdraw in, in your recent book. Can you share a little bit about that um, in case there are listeners who are considering it or even by listening to this conversation or for the first time thinking about the possibility of coming off? So what, do you, what does it look like to carefully come off of it? Well, I, I think the first thing to say is it is probably the case that the longer you have been on something, the more problematic it will be. So if you've been on a drug for more than a few months, you really need to reduce it very slowly and carefully. I think the best advice um, that I've heard is to make a small reduction and see how it goes. And if it goes okay and you don't experience any withdrawal symptoms, then you can maybe even try a larger reduction. Um, but as soon as you try a reduction that gives you withdrawal symptoms, then you know you've hit um, you, you know, you've, you've reduced a bit too much 
Um, or maybe you can tolerate the withdrawal symptoms and they're not too bad and, and they'll pass in a few weeks. But you need to sort of, you know, titrate it against the withdrawal symptoms you experience. Mm. The other thing that's important is that as you get down to lower doses, the reductions you make will have more of an impact um, uh, in the brain, the, the, the concentrations um, of the drug in your brain um, go down go down more quickly as you um, I'm not really not seeing this very clearly. Um, as you get down to lower doses, you need to make smaller reductions because uh, a smaller dose um, at low doses, a small dose can have a larger effect than it has at higher doses, if that makes, makes sense. sense. It does. So you might be able to make a reduction of, say, five milligrams um, in your diazepam if you're on sort of 30 or 40 milligrams a day. But if you're only on five milligrams a day, it's very unlikely you could stop that five milligrams and not notice some withdrawal effects. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and even a reduction of two or one milligram, you might notice down at those low doses. Mm. This was something that I mentioned in a recent conversation I had with the journalist Robert Whitaker. So some people listening may have also heard me say this then, but I just think it's so interesting the, the difference between how we advise people to withdraw from legal drugs versus recreational drugs. And I work with many people who are severely addicted to methamphetamine or heroin um, or even, you know, prescription drugs like Adderall or fentanyl, you know, and alcohol, of course. And the attitude we take toward people who are using illicit drugs is much less, um, what's the right word, Sen sensitive, I suppose, or, or forgiving and patient. In so many cases, I've witnessed people be severely addicted to, let's say, methamphetamine or heroin, and then they just get thrown in jail. And the expectation is, you're going to sober up in jail and you need to just fight through the withdrawal symptoms. And there, they are often hellacious, you know, especially with heroin, people are just horribly sick for a couple of weeks. And yet, you know, all the kind of authorities around them are just saying, Oh, well, sober up. You made the choice to do this drug. So just get through it. And I'm not saying that, you know, I don't think that's the right approach. I think there there could be more support and maybe more strategic ways of coming off of those drugs. Um, I mean, um, prison is probably really the hard end of that because for people who are in, you know, who attend an addiction service, mm -hmm. there would be the option of withdrawing more slowly of using methadone. I mean, methadone is because it's a very long acting opiate is a way of reducing the dose very, very gradually. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and slowly. Um, and certainly people who have uh, an addiction to benzodiazepines, even recreational benzodiazepines, are advised to withdraw very slowly. And you're not allowed anymore to take people off benzodiazepines, not in this country anyway, very quickly in an inpatient unit, for example. It has to be done slowly in the community. Mm. Uh, so I think it, it depends a little bit on, on the context. Mm -hmm. um, because I've, I've, so I've worked in addiction services quite a bit in my life. And I think there are some lessons that we can learn from addiction services to help people who have problems with prescribed medication or would like to try and come off medication. You know, if you've had a problem with heroin or, um, or with alcohol, um, you know, you will often be offered rehabilitation. And the idea is that that will help you to recognize how the drug affected your thinking and your behavior when you were on it and how you can adjust to life without the drug and how you can fill the gap that, that, that the drug was filling for you. Um, and it really, you know, it really enables people to, um, you know, to develop alternative strategies and to think through what, 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 the, what the drug was doing to them yeah. in quite a detailed way. And I think, we need to apply that, you know, apply some of those principles to people who are taking prescription drugs because an awful lot of these drugs really blot out people's normal emotions. Um, and so when they come at, off them, 
they're experiencing um, normal emotions again, which they find, you know, may find difficult because they haven't experienced them for a long time. Plus they're often experiencing, you know, hyper, hyper inflated emotions, sort of rebound emotions because they've been suppressed for so long. So the nervous system, as I said, is in this sort of state of hyper arousal. So I think it's really important for people who've on pre- been on prescription drugs too, to understand what the drugs have been doing to them. Not, not that that's necessarily why they were taking them, um, but they, they, they still need to understand that's what the drugs were doing nevertheless. And then to try and, you know, work out ways that they can manage the, um, you know, man- manage to replace the, the good things that the drug might have, have brought to them without getting all the um, harms that it brings along with it. Mm. And something you talk about, the psychiatrist Peter Bregan has talked about is the idea of spellbinding, the way that it's difficult to recognize these things that you're talking about while you're with the drug in your system. In the same exact way that it, that when we drink alcohol, our judgment is impaired and our gauge of just how intoxicated we are is not quite accurate. And so I just think it's, yeah, it's, it's very important to to see, to, to be in the context of other people, professionals and, and supportive figures who can help reflect back to you what these effects are, because it's not always easy to see, especially when your self-awareness is impaired. And then, yeah, to really watch this closely as you, as you titrate and eventually withdraw. So I think, that, I think that's a really good point. And I also think it's really important that people, once they've got off drugs, reflect back on how they were changing them and share that information on the internet or somewhere because, mm. because that will help people who are taking drugs currently to properly evaluate whether those drugs are really helping them or not. Yes. Um, one thing that worries me, of course, is that you know some professionals don't reflect back very accurately to people how they are and will just say, oh, you're much better mm. because someone is actually quieter and less troublesome. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're really better inside. It doesn't mean that anything's resolved. This is, um, this is and sometimes appearing to be better may may not be better. This is critical. I, I think I often think about the word works and how the word works has been used throughout history. Right. You know, because we used to say like, you know, yeah, frontal lobotomies work. But what do we mean by that word is the big question. And if a person goes from being manic to kind of sedated, many people would look at that and say, look, this drug works or this procedure works. But works has never meant this person is functioning optimally and is experiencing fulfillment and is thriving. It's always meant that there's the symptoms have been, you know, have disappeared or have been lowered. So that's, that's really important. I think we need to heighten the standard of what we mean by the word works with all these different treatments and that it should mean optimal functioning. Absolutely. I mean, I remember during my um, uh, career, you know, earlier career when I was a trainee, numerous different circumstances where I was conv- confronted with a patient who, um, who had been lively and maybe troublesome along with being lively and was now sedated, zombified, often drooling, clearly totally impaired. And the doctor, the senior doctor is saying, oh, look, they're so much better. I mean, I remember several circumstances, situations like that. And I I think, you know, I think lots of interesting things are happening then, you know, um, some of the staff in order to avoid the conclusion that what they're actually doing is modifying someone's behavior that they don't like, are translating it into a sort of medical language of saying, oh, look, we've treated something, this has worked, this is Mm. good. Um, Because it is uncomfortable to feel that what you're doing is modifying someone, making them fit in with the status quo. Mm. Um, But I think that is partly what psychiatry is about and I would even go so far as to say that sometimes I think that's necessary I do think there are some people whose behavior is really out of control and irrational and chaotic and potentially dangerous and sometimes I think it's okay for society to step in then and say actually 
no, we, we're not tolerating this. Mm. But I think we need to be honest about it because if we're not honest about it, we will do more harm than, than good. And we, you know, we, we, we won't put in the safeguards that we really need to do if we're going to you know, act as social policemen. Mm. And this is something I've seen, listened to you talk about or read from you, I can't remember, but you talked about the, the balance that needs to be struck between honoring autonomy and protecting the public. And I think that you're kind of speaking to this right now. And I, I feel like this is one of the big questions that, you know, the sort of original um, critic of psychiatry, Thomas Saz, raised, which is who are we benefiting when we prescribe these drugs? And, you know, his point was primarily ourselves as the outsiders, the public, we're benefiting ourselves by sedating this person. And then, you know, of course, in some cases, it is beneficial to the person, but in many cases, we're just making it easier on ourselves to not have to deal with this person. And and the other thing that I know you've talked about and he talked about was just the the concept of chemical straitjackets and how when you put someone in a straitjacket, there's no question that you are like imposing some type of serious restriction on them. You are taking away their autonomy. That is undeniable. You see it with your own eyes what you're doing. But with prescription drugs, sometimes it has that same effect in that you're taking away their autonomy, but you don't really see that you're doing that. You don't see that you're forcing them into a straight jacket. But in a sense, sometimes that the effect is quite similar. Absolutely. Thomas Saz put it so well. He said, restraint by chemical means doesn't make us feel guilty. And mm-hmm. therein lies the danger. There and, and so right. Um, where I probably diverge from him is that he felt or, or, or he implied in his early writing, I'm not sure he really would go along with this, actually, and certainly later on, but he implied in his early writing that the, the, the criminal law is, is enough to deal with antisocial or dangerous behavior mm. uh, and that we don't need other mechanisms. And I, if you'd spoken to me 20 years ago, I would have absolutely supported that view. I don't think I'd do any more. I think um, you know, I've read, read some really good historical ca- accounts of, of the law. And I think we've always historically had um, other less formal measures of social control to deal with the sort of behavior that the criminal law can't deal with because people are too chaotic or too irrational to, um, to answer to a charge. And I, I think that we do need some of those mechanisms. And I think Thomas Saz actually did acknowledge that in some of his writing, he would talk about how, um, how if people lacked competence, then there should be legal mechanisms, not medical, but legal mechanisms for, mm. for um, dealing with them. And, and if, are you saying these mechanisms, these mechanisms would include um, mental health professionals, social workers, the use of prescription drugs? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's, that's what they include at the moment. I'm not, mm. saying, I'm not saying that the system we had at, have at the moment is, is right or perfect mm. at all, partly because it's not transparent. Um, Saz would have said it should be a, le- you know, it must very clearly be within a legal framework. And I think that's absolutely right. We need mm-hmm. to acknowledge this is, you know, uh, if we're taking away someone's liberty, this is, uh, this needs to be a proper legal, legally endorsed action, um, not a, an action that is dressed up as being a medical one. Mm. So it's very significant to me that you know, you're kind of an insider, you you are a psychiatrist, you have gone through the same training as psychiatrists, and yet you've ended up with a very different understanding and approach. And so I'm curious to know a little bit about your personal journey with this. Like, was there a time that you totally bought into the disease-centered model? Um, And what, what was it like to kind of awaken to what you're aware of now? I, I feel I always disappoint people when I'm asked this question because no, I was never like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no. I never bought, no, I never bought into it. 
Um, so why did I do it would, is really the question. Mm. Um, uh, I, you know, psychiatry has always interested me. You know, I think madness is, is, is something, it is an interesting state of mind that we need to learn from. I, you know, I really like um, Foucault's observation that, you know, prior to the Enlightenment, the mad had this sort of symbolic role in, psych in society as being able to sort of hold up and reflect our, our you know, conventional assumptions and, and make us question them. Um, so, you know, I was always interested by psychiatry, but always, always, I'm afraid from the very start, sceptical. Mm. Um, there wasn't really an awakening. But, um, but I suppose my understanding of, of drug treatment and what it's doing came gradually, just, just from a feeling of a, such a mis mismatch between what was claimed and what was in front of my eyes. Like I said, with the, you know, with the treatment of, of people who might be described as psychotic with antipsychotics and, you know, they're sort of practically wheeled in, you know, very impaired um, and sedated and said to be better. And then the other thing was with antidepressants, you know, it, Everyone was started on antidepressants. Some people got a bit better. Some people didn't get a bit better. It, it, the majority didn't really. If the, the people who did, there seemed to be lots of other explanations for why they might have got better. It just didn't seem to me obvious that there was any connection between taking an antidepressant and improving. Mm. And that's why when I started to look at the literature on um, the placebo controlled trials of antidepressants, you know, what, what was this idea that they were effective based on? Um, and that's when I you know, uh, uncovered ideas like the idea that they're really just an active placebo that, you know, people know, people in trials know that they're taking an active drug mm. and not taking the inert placebo. And therefore you've not really got rid of the placebo effect, which we know is very strong in a condition like depression. Mm. Um, and so I suppose that's where I started thinking about questioning the assumptions that we have that drugs are working by correcting some underlying abnormality and mm. thinking about what drugs are actually doing to people and how that affects people um, directly in a pharmacological way, you know, um, whether it's sedation or, uh, um, or emotional suppression or whatever it is, or, uh, but also how it affects people psychologically to think that they're taking something that might make them better and that somehow symbolizes this idea that what's wrong with them is some sort of physical brain defect mm. rather than a problem in their lives, a problem, you know, that maybe they need to get to grips with and, and get over. Maybe they need help with that, but not something that can be tweaked with, with uh, chemistry. Mm. That's, I think an extremely important point. I, I've always noticed, so one thing I think that you um, emphasize that I think is so important is that fundamentally these psychiatric drugs work in the same way as recreational drugs in that they essentially are psychoactive substances. They alter neurotransmitter activity. And it's important that we don't, you know, try to separate them out too much from recreational drugs, given that they operate under the same mechanisms. And whenever we observe people, let's say, who are drinking too much alcohol every day, what's clear to see is that they never, they, they seem to avoid addressing core problems, whether those are maladaptive habits, repressed emotions, just circumstances that need to be addressed that are not being addressed, their responsibilities, et cetera. And I noticed that the people who I know in my life who are totally sober, who don't have any psychoactive substances in their system, they tend to recognize when their life is off course, even slightly, and they can course correct before things get dramatically off course, because they're so sensitive to their, their self and, and how, whether life feels right. Whereas when people are sedated with alcohol or whatever drug, they don't course correct until it gets more extreme, until it's noticeable even to the most blunted perception. And then at that point, the thought of getting back on course 
is actually quite daunting because you're so off course, which then kind of motivates the person to just drink even more. So it, it, it can really avalanche like that. Um, and so I, I see a similarity, you know, and just that point there that if you are made to believe that the reason you're depressed is because you have faulty brain chemistry and that's what you believe, but the core issue is maybe anything else, like anything actually psychological or behavioral or circumstantial or cultural, those problems just won't be addressed and will be under the wrong impression about what's actually causing the condition. I, I absolutely agree. I think you've put it very well. You know, and I think when we recommend people to take antidepressants or anti-anxiety drugs, we're effectively saying the same thing as if we said, go off and get drunk every day. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's a much weaker effect they have, but they are still, I think, blunting people's emotional responses mm. in the same sort of way that most recreational drugs do in one way or another. Mm. So something that was really important for me to appreciate is that just because a drug doesn't make most people feel good doesn't mean that it's different from recreational drugs. So, so drug, you know, drugs make different drugs give us different sorts of sensations and feelings. And some people like some of them and some people don't like others. So, you know, there's a group of people that like the sort of sensations that you get when you take heroin. There's a group of people that like the sort of effects you get when you take alcohol but there are some people that really don't like those effects. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't like the effects of antipsychotics very much. They, they find them quite unpleasant, but some people do. Some people would rather be in any sort of altered state of mind than, than be sober. Mm. Often people who've got into a habit of, you know, using drugs to run away from something for a long time. Mm. Um, so, so just because some of the drugs we prescribe in psychiatry don't make people feel good and are not generally street, don't, don't have a street value, not generally drugs of abuse, doesn't mean that they're not psychoactive drugs. They're still changing the way that people think and feel and behave. And I think that that was a crucial realization for me. And the other thing that I think is really important to, to um, acknowledge, and this comes back to the withdrawal point, is that just because you don't get a very obvious sort of physical withdrawal syndrome like you get with opiates or alcohol doesn't mean that there are not all sorts of physiological changes going on when you stop taking a drug. So, so you know, addiction specialists often talk about amphetamines or stimulants not being physically addictive. Well, they're not physically addictive in the sense that if you stop them overnight, it's not dangerous. You won't have dangerous physical complications, but there will be a physical withdrawal syndrome. It will consist of your heart rate going very slow and this sort of compensatory slowing down after everything, you know, after the stimulant effects of being sort of, um, you, you know, stimulating your cardiovascular system and your neurological system. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think it's important to recognize that that, uh, that that all drugs have withdrawal syndromes of one sort or another. Yes. Just because they're not obvious, you know, there aren't obvious dangerous physical symptoms mm. doesn't mean there's not physical withdrawal going on. And also that drugs can have psychoactive effects, mind changing and brain changing effects without being appealing in any way, without generally being liked. Mm. Although the effects of drugs that people like and don't like vary enormously. I think that's, that's an important thing to say. Right. Right. That's a great point. Yeah. It's like anytime you alter brain function, there will be compensations given mm. the principle of homeostasis. So, yeah. So let me talk, let me raise this. Um, I asked for an hour of your time. We're approaching that. And one thing I wanted to make sure to bring up is, what some people might consider to be an elephant in the room, which is the influence of the pharmaceutical industry. And what I'm curious to know is if you have experienced, like how you have felt um, influenced, and maybe you're, you're a unique case because you were never really um, 
under the spell, so to speak, of the narrative. But what have you witnessed or, or what are you aware of in terms of how pharmaceutical companies are able to influence the prescribing practices of psychiatrists? So when I was, again, a junior trainee, I took a small amount of money from Roche Pharmaceuticals who make diazepam um, to go to a conference. And in, in, in those days, no one else was going to pay me to go to a conference. Uh, and, and I wanted to go, or my friends and colleagues were going. And I will always have a soft spot for Roche. And, and you know, I think that's... And, and so doctors will tell you that they're not influenced by being given things, they absolutely are. They absolutely are, we all are. Um, and so when, uh, when we hear that pharmaceutical companies are paying doctors or psychiatrists to write papers or to give talks for them um, or, or anything else, we, you know, we, we really need to take all that information with a huge pinch of salt because it will not be objective, it will be, it will reflect the interests of the person who's paying the piper. Mm. Yes. And I know that um, in the UK, you use the ICD, the International Classification of Disease, to make diagnoses in the US. Um, psychiatrists use the Diagnostic Statistical Manual and so I'm not as familiar as with how um, new diagnostic criteria are added to the ICD as I am with the DSM, but one of the extremely controversial facts about the DSM committee, which is, consists of about 27 doctors who, for lack of a better way to put it, vote on whether a condition should be added or a criterion should be added to the new editions of the DSM. Um, the numbers are that about 68% of them have taken money from drug companies. And so we see this influence both in the foundation of diagnosing as well as in which drugs are prescribed. And maybe it's obvious, but just in case people are you know, it would help to, to say this for listeners. The reason that it's beneficial for a pharmaceutical company to influence psychiatrists is number one, if you can influence psychiatrists to broaden diagnostic criteria, then you increase the number of people who could be taking the drug. And if you, of course, influence a psychiatrist to want to prescribe your drug in particular, you know, as a pharmaceutical company, then again, you just kind of elevate yourself in the competition and make it more likely that more people will take your drug. And so again, maybe this is obvious to listeners, like why this is a conflict of interest, but I just wanted to explain that in case it's not. And the other thing I think too is that it seems to me that psychiatrists are probably um, desirable targets for pharmaceutical companies, particularly because the diagnosis can be made very easily. Um, I think it's the least objective type of diagnosis in all of medicine, given that you can just listen to someone talk about their symptoms or observe their behavior and, and diagnose them. You don't have to do any kind of objective testing. So um, psychiatric diagnoses are highly malleable, aren't they? Mm -hmm. and, and you can also go out there and persuade people to understand their distress and problems in different ways. You know, that's uh, basically what happened over the 1990s. People in the 1980s, people had anxiety. In the 1990s, they were told, no, it's not anxiety, it's depression, because now we've got antidepressants to sell. Uh, and then that very same distress gets um, gets packaged and marketed uh, later on in the 90s and the noughties as either bipolar disorder or ADHD or a variety of mm. other sorts of, uh, of things in order to sell, you know, new drugs. Mm. And it's so interesting. And again, just so listeners are aware, the United States is is one of two countries where pharmaceutical companies are allowed to advertise directly to the consumer. 
And I feel like for people who have grown up in the U.S., steeped in this culture, it's just so normal that they see these advertisements on the television saying, like, ask your doctor about this antidepressant. Um, and it's, I, I think it's important to realize, like, that's not actually normal in the rest yeah. of the world. When, when, I, when I come to the U.S. and I see them... I, I, I find them really shocking. I mm. find it really, really shocking to see a, a, a drug advertised, a psychiatric drug in particular, advertised on the television. And that's because it, so much else goes with a psychiatric drug. So many messages about what sort of person you are, what, what, what it means to be a person in the first place. You know, if you're advertising an antidepressant, you are making a statement that you know, being unhappy, being depressed is, a, is, is an abnormal state. It's a mm. disease. So you're making an existential statement. Right. You're not just advertising a drug. Mm. And it's an existential statement that I think is, is potentially really harmful and misleading and has, you know, has ended up with millions of people taking drugs that are probably aren't doing them any good mm. and are, are stopping them from doing the things that might, might be more helpful. Mm. Along with that existential statement, I feel like one of the, the messages that gets transmitted is that if you have this, that's the nature of your brain and like this implication that it's permanent. You're, you're, de you're a depressed person yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the yeah. same way that you can have diabetes and like that's a fact about your biology. And so it's important to just challenge that. I mean, so much... Of, so many cases, depression and anxiety and things like this are developmentally related or circumstantially related or societally related, but above all, temporal. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think it's really important to emphasize, especially for young people. I, I, um, you know, I think it's easy to, you know, all young people struggle with, with emotions. And I, I think we're, I'm taking this partly from um, my, my friend and colleague, Sami Tamimi, who's been writing about this. I, I think we're encouraging young people to pathologize their emotions and, and not be able to tolerate anymore the normal, strong emotions that you feel as a teenager and a young yes. person. Um, and I think that's really dangerous because then they won't learn that actually you can get through this and mm. life gets better, <laughs> you know, you get older and you do learn how to manage them. Well, this is a natural segue to the last question I wanted to ask you, which is in your view, what are the other solutions besides psychiatric drugs to promote one's own well-being? And perhaps you can speak to it on the two levels of kind of collective, cultural, societal, as well as individual? Yeah, yeah. So starting with the, the societal one, I do think that an awful lot of the uh, misery and unhappiness and difficulties that people experience in the modern world could be addressed by ensuring that people had financial security, had employment opportunities, had housing security um, and, uh, and, and had the opportunity to do things that they enjoyed and gave them some purpose and meaning in life. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should be striving for a society that provides those things for people um, rather than, rather than um, expecting people somehow to find them will create them themselves when, when you can't do that sort of thing on your own. Um, and I think, I think that would resolve a lot of the difficulties that, that I see, particularly in the UK. I used to work in a very deprived part of London, and the vast majority of people I saw had really substantial difficulties with housing, with finances. Um, they were surrounded by... Uh, you know, people who were using drugs and, and gangs that were, you know, causing crime everywhere. And life was just really, really difficult for most people. Um, so, so I think that's really important. And, and I think the other, the other side of the coin is, 
helping individuals to find find constructive ways of managing um, unpleasant feelings, of getting over difficult situations, of changing situations um, that make them feel awful mm -hmm. when they possibly can, um, or finding ways to adapt if there really isn't any possible way of changing that sort of situation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like I was saying about young people, of, of, re of helping people to learn the skills to... Um, to manage emotions and to, you know, find find ways of living that are are satisfying to themselves and and not damaging to other people, which sometimes isn't, you know, it isn't straightforward for people, especially if they're, you know, growing up in circumstances where those opportunities are difficult to find. Right. Mm. What would you say? I guess an. A encore question or bonus question here if you don't mind what do you say or what would you say to fellow psychiatrists who are who have fully bought into the disease centered narrative and who do what i have witnessed too often which let's say the most extreme the most extreme end of this where they're often making diagnoses within five or ten minutes of seeing somebody and prescriptions within five or ten minutes of seeing somebody and they're telling their patients that they most likely need to be on this drug for the rest of their life what would you say to this surprisingly high percentage of psychiatrists who practice like this well i would say that they are almost certainly doing much more harm than good that they're setting people off on a course of a, a course that will inevitably lead to lots of nasty adverse effects and it will be very unlikely to actually resolve the underlying problem. Thankfully, in the UK, I don't think there are lots of psychiatrists like that. Um, and most psychiatrists in the UK would see themselves as practicing a biopsychosocial approach. So although they might prescribe drugs, they will also look at psychological and social factors that are precipitating or maintaining someone's difficulties. And what I would say to them is the problem is the, the biological trumps the rest of it. Mm. So if you tell someone they have a brain disease or you imply to someone that they have a brain disease by giving them something which is going to work by, re they are told is going to work by rectifying some abnormality they've got, then why should they? change their ways of behaving or their so social circumstances um, unless it's to adapt to having this disease there might be some sort of adaptation required but why 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 would they try and address their problems in a different way if their problems are biological mm. and so i think that even for psychiatrists who who uh, work in a biopsychosocial way i would say you maybe underestimating how powerful the message contained in that pill that you have prescribed is because many people will just hear i have a brain disease i need to take this pill and that and and they will not hear all the stuff about actually you know maybe there are other ways you could address this problem maybe you need to um uh, you, you know maybe you could change your circumstances maybe you could go and get help to change your circumstances Mm. You know, many people won't hear that because what they what they see and they hear is the disease and the pill. Excellent point. Dr. But Monk, you, what, you probably go, have lots of the awful ones who really <laughs> you know, who just need to just, be told that they're wrong and this is really bad for people. Mm. Yes. And, you know, like one... I see it in the jail. There's a psychiatrist in the jail. And it, it's that extreme end of the spectrum that I described of just quick diagnoses, quick prescriptions. I mean, people in jail know that if they want a downer or if they want an upper, they can just go to the psychiatrist and like report symptoms. They can just make them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. extremely problematic. And then I've seen, you know, in that, in that dissertation I mentioned, I was able to, you know, with permission, obviously, um, attain psychiatric notes on these patients 
and they were just so oversimplified. I was so surprised by that. And mm-hmm. so I just want to say too, like, I think uh, in talking about all this, I don't want to just overly generalize and make it sound like all psychiatrists are under the spell of this disease centered narrative and, and practice in the way that I've described. Not, not all of them do, of course, but too many do in my view. So I should have mentioned the critical psychiatry network. I think yes. it was on your list of questions yes. Yes. Um, because there are, there are a minority of psychiatrists who, who I think are quite skeptical of the disease centered model of, of drug action and of the idea that you know that you that you can understand mental health problems as if they were medical diseases and I got some of these people together in what I call the critical psychiatry network as a partly to campaign partly as a a means of mutual support Mm. I I would say that we're a minority but but we are out there (laughs) thank you for mentioning that the critical psychiatry network and are you international do people we do have members in the united states yes excellent i am super grateful for what you do and so i just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for forging the path that you forge and for joining me in conversation at the end of your long work day <laughs> thank so, you. yeah so thank you so much and thank you. It's a yeah pleasure. It's really interesting thank you you're absolutely welcome. And I'll, I'll definitely recommend to everyone still listening to read at least one of your books and look at your website and check out the Critical Psychiatry Network. And, and remember that if you know, if you are someone listening now who feels depressed, feels anxious, feels like your mood fluctuates drastically, there is hope. And there are supportive people who can help you through this and that it's in nature temporary. And the answer is probably not in a pill. And maybe a pill can act kind of like a Band-Aid and help, you know, bring about certain effects that make it a little bit easier to make changes in your life. But that's about what their value is. And that definitely they're not meant to be taken for the rest of your life. So become as educated as you can and take control of your mental health and seek support wherever you can. And just remember, yeah, you, you're going to be okay. That's the message I guess I'd want to send here at the end of this conversation. So again, really appreciate you joining me. You're a very sought after person. You've been working all day and you spent over an hour of your time with me. So let's stay yeah, in touch. I would love to read your thesis, Nick. Okay. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you have a condensed version, do you? <laughs> I actually do. Yeah, funny you say. I, I published a, a condensed version in the Journal of Orthomolecular Medicine right after I graduated. So I'd be happy to send that to you. I'd really be interested to read that. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, well, I look, I look forward okay. to staying in touch and maybe talking again in the future. Okay, okay. Nice to meet you. You too. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.